With regret, I'm here to inform you that the skeletal remains found on December 11th are those of the missing toddler, Kaylee Anthony. The manner of death in this case is homicide. It's the story that transfixed the nation. An adorable two-year-old girl dead. This is a child that was just dumped in the woods like a piece of trash. A young, hard-partying mother accused of being the killer. Casey, where is Kaylee's body? And a verdict that stuns millions. We, the jury, find the defendant not guilty. Murderer walks free! But for all the media coverage, interviews, and legal testimony, the whole story of Kaylee Anthony hasn't been told until now. For the first time, we'll see the case through the eyes of Dr. Jan Garavaglia, the medical examiner in charge of Kaylee's autopsy and the star expert witness at her mother's trial. This child had duct tape over its lower face. And the main target of the defense attorney's attacks. He has the nerve to call my work shoddy? Now, Dr. G will expose intimate details never before revealed. I just can't believe that actually that didn't come off the trial. There's a lot more to this story than you guys could ever, ever imagine. And try to answer the question still on everyone's mind. What happened to Kaylee Anthony? And it was really a horrendous piece of information. <laughs> the strange, tragic case of little Kaylee Anthony begins at 8.08 p.m. on July 15, 2008, with a panic-wrought 911 call. I found out my granddaughter has been taken. What is the name? Kaylee, C-A-Y-L-E-E, -E, Anthony. She's missing. Kaylee Anthony, where are you? Yes, I need to find her. The caller is Kaylee Anthony's grandmother, Cindy, and the story she begins to tell police is astounding, disturbing, but also riddled with details that seem to make no sense at all. Kaylee Marie Anthony is born August 9th, 2005, in Orlando, Florida. Her mother, Casey, is just 19 and still living at home with her own parents, George and Cindy Anthony. Kaylee is a very happy child. She called her grandfather Jojo. She loved to swim. She clearly looked like a very happy child. In June of 2008, according to Cindy, Casey tells her that she needs to go to Jacksonville for work. And she's going to take Kaylee with her. She told them she had a job. She told them um, she worked at Universal Studios. Several weeks pass without incident. Then on July 15, 2008, things take an unexpected turn. Cindy and George Anthony discover that their daughter's car was abandoned at a strip mall parking lot and has been towed to an impound lot in Orlando. But what is Casey's car doing in Orlando when she's supposed to be in Jacksonville? Unable to reach his daughter, Casey's father, George, claims the car from the impound lot. It's a trip that brings an unsettling discovery. When he got to the Pontiac at the wrecker yard, it reeked. He was a former law enforcement officer. George knows what a dead body smells like. And he really thought to himself, I really hope Kaylee or Casey, I'm not going to find them in this trunk. George opens the trunk and finds a bag of trash. For the moment, he's relieved, but they still haven't heard from Casey. Cindy Anthony was able to track down Casey at her boyfriend's house. That's when Casey told her that Kaylee was missing. She had been gone for 30 days. She was supposedly kidnapped by a nanny. That's when Cindy calls 911. 911, what's your emergency? I found out my granddaughter has been taken. She has been missing for a month. Then, Cindy goes on to give the 911 operator some disturbing information. There's something wrong. I found my daughter's car today, and it smells like there's been a dead body in the damn car. Okay, what is someone here now? 
Meanwhile, Casey did get on the line and seemed rather calm. Can you tell me a little bit what's going on? My daughter's been missing for the last 31 days. Why, why are you calling now? Why didn't you call 31 days ago? I've been looking for her and have gone through other resources to try to find her, which was stupid. If my kids were gone for 31 seconds, it would, I'd freak out. I can't imagine 31 days. I really don't remember when I first heard that there was a toddler missing in Orlando, but you couldn't help but knowing about it. It became a huge news story in this community. Detective Yuri Mellish is assigned to the case. When he arrives at the Anthony's home, his first priority is to get information about the nanny who Casey claims has abducted her daughter. You took Casey to a babysitter's house? Yes. Is there anything about this story that you're telling me that is untrue? Or is there anything that you want to change or divert from what you've already told me? No, sir. After hours of interviewing Casey, police launch a full-scale investigation led by Detective Mellish. It begins with a visit to the home of the nanny. But when police arrive, the apartment is vacant. The babysitter, so far as anyone can, can determine, never actually existed, though she was described in great detail by, by Casey on, on more than one occasion. And that's not the only thing about Casey's story that doesn't add up. Casey was claiming that she worked at Universal Studios, had a job as an event planner. The police went to Universal and determined that, in fact, she didn't work there. She hadn't worked there in over a year. Investigators proved through cell phone records that Casey never left Orlando the entire month. On July 16th, nearly 24 hours after the 911 calls, Casey Anthony is arrested and charged with aggravated child neglect and lying to investigators. Casey denies the charge and immediately hires a lawyer Jose Baez. Baez was a relatively unknown attorney. Baez declares that Casey is innocent. Casey doesn't know where Kaylee is. If she knew where she was, she would have told me, she would have uh, told the police, she would have told her family. And we're here to move forward in finding Kaylee. Meanwhile, pictures surface on the internet showing Casey out partying even entering a hot body contest during the time she claimed to be looking for Kaylee. In one photo, she is showing off a new tattoo. And the tattoo artist who etched Bella Vita, or Beautiful Life, on Casey's back two weeks after Kaylee disappeared told us all Casey talked about was her new boyfriend. The story of a missing little girl and the sexy photos of her mother plastered on the internet cause an instant media frenzy. When these pictures were taken on June 20th at Fusion Ultra Lounge in Orlando, Casey's daughter had been missing for five days. We have a mother whose actions and activities are inconsistent with a mother whose child has gone missing and that she does not know where her child is or what happened to her child. While Casey sits in jail, Authorities launch a massive hunt for her daughter. George and Cindy Anthony are at the forefront of the search. Cindy and George wholeheartedly believe their granddaughter is still alive and their daughter is innocent. She is not dead. Hundreds of people came out to search for her. Coming up, as the hunt for Kaylee continues, police uncover shocking new evidence that will turn the case upside down. And it was really a horrendous piece of information. By October of 2008, two-year-old Kaylee Anthony has been missing for four months. As the search for her continues, law enforcement officials conduct a forensic exam of her mother's car. The vehicle had been in Casey's possession from the last time Kaylee was seen until it was towed and then eventually reclaimed by the Anthony's and the police received it. The police first test the air inside the trunk and detect high levels of chloroform, a chemical that could be used to render someone unconscious. 
It's an unexpected finding, and it isn't long before investigators uncover even more startling evidence in the trunk. A Caucasian head hair found exhibits characteristics of apparent decomposition at the root. A mitochondrial DNA test goes on to say that the hair could belong to Kaylee. If the report is accurate, that hair would have fallen off Kaylee's dead body. Investigators now believe that Kaylee is dead and that at some point, her dead body was in the trunk of her mother's car. It's always hard to prove a murder without a body, but we felt that between the odor evidence in the car and the hair and the chloroform, which was found in the trunk, we just felt was sufficient to give it to the grand jury. With this evidence, 22-year-old Casey Anthony is charged with her daughter's murder. An Orange County grand jury has issued an indictment on the following charges. First degree murder, aggravated child abuse, aggravated manslaughter of a child, and four counts of providing false information to law enforcement. On December 11, 2008, two months after Casey Anthony is charged with murder, a meter reader from the city of Orlando named Roy Kronk takes a break and walks into an overgrown field some 20 feet off the road in a residential area where something catches his eye. And then he must have uh, noticed, you know, that, yeah, this probably is a scalp. He notifies his boss, who immediately calls 911. Sheriff Communications. Yes, this is Orange County Utilities Emergency Dispatch. We found a human skull. Oh, my gosh. Lead detective Yuri Mellish in turn calls Steve Hansen, Dr. G's chief investigator. And Yuri said, Steve, we found a, a skeleton. And I'm going, OK. He said, we, we think it could be Kaylee Anthony. And I'm going, you're kidding me, right? And I turned to Steve and I said, unless it's really important, don't bother me with it. And he goes, it is. They found a skeleton near the home of where Casey Anthony lived and I, my heart sank. Once the body was discovered, it was a real game changer because there's going to be forensic evidence either associated with the body or the area where the body was found. All they found is a skull of a small child they believe is a little girl, Kaylee Anthony, who's been missing since June. We knew at this point the eyes of at least Orlando were on us. We didn't realize that the eyes of the country, even the world, were on us. When I drove up to the scene, it was a zoo. There are media trucks. There are crowds of people. There are police cars. Hanson meets Detective Mellish at the scene, who leads him to a densely wooded, swampy area. Scattered among the leaves are some small bones, the skull, two garbage bags, and a laundry bag. There are also remnants of a toddler-sized T-shirt and shorts, along with a baby blanket. It clearly had the pattern of Winnie the Pooh with Piglet on its back. This is clearly a baby blanket. It, it just makes it a little sadder. My first thought was, let's get the right team. Dr. G immediately calls John Schultz, a forensic anthropologist from the University of Central Florida and an expert in the recovery and identification of skeletal remains. I am often called whenever there is a skeletal dispersal uh, to work with the law enforcement agency that's involved. Dr. G also calls in Dr. Michael Warren, a University of Florida professor and forensic anthropologist who specializes in analyzing children's skeletons. Everyone has a specific research interest and I have some experience with juveniles. With the help of the Orange County crime scene personnel, Dr. G and her team carefully document and recover the evidence and bones that are scattered in a radius over 30 feet. There was evidence on the bones or animals uh, had, had chewed the remains, taking parts of the skeleton away. They found bones 
that were smaller than the nail on your little finger in dense underbrush. Unbelievable, the job and the documentation they did. When they study the location and pattern of the bones, Dr. G and her team make a key discovery. The body of the child had to have been placed out there prior to really any significant decomposition. These bones had to have been there for months. And there was nothing inconsistent with them being placed there about the time she uh, went missing. And that's very important. This is a child that was just dumped in the woods like a piece of trash. It was my job to not only identify the body, but to determine the cause and manner of death or to collect any information from that body that could help us piece together what happened. Dr. G sends the tibia or shin bone, the most intact bone recovered, to the FBI lab for identification to find out if the remains are indeed Kaylee's. But the results won't come back for seven days. In the meantime, Dr. G continues her examination. Whenever you do a forensic exam, you have to listen to what that body's telling you. Coming up, it would be an autopsy for the history books, and one with secrets that would never make it into the newspapers or the courtroom. Sometimes the bodies scream out what happened, and sometimes they whisper. In the District 9 morgue in Orlando, Florida, Chief Medical Examiner Dr. G turns to the evidence photos of the skeleton believed to be the missing two-year-old, Kaylee Anthony. But one picture in particular concerns her the most. It's a pretty horrendous picture. This child had duct tape over its lower face. Even though the glue on this duct tape has disintegrated and only the mesh remains, Incredibly, it is still attached to the hair. The hair is kind of all intertwined in that mesh, and it was attached to it. Then, Dr. G looks at what's under the tape. Lo and behold, all the teeth were still present in the man bone. Incredible. Particularly with a child jaw, those little tiny baby teeth, they don't have any roots. They come right out. Not only are the teeth still in place, but the jaw is still attached to the skull. Normally, there's nothing holding the jaw or mandible to the skull. There's nothing that keeps it together when you decompose it. And for Dr. G, this finding is both disturbing and telling. The duct tape told us that it was put there before she started to decompose. The question is, was it over her nose? Was it over her mouth? It was certainly in that area. Could I have gone out on the limb and say she suffocated with that tape? I can't say for certain, but that duct tape was put there for a reason. Dr. G and her team also inspect the skull for any signs of trauma that could give her a definitive cause of death. We examined it on the outside, we examined it on the inside. We x-rayed it. There was no reason to open it, but we were able to look inside that skull with a light, with a mirror. We do a very thorough examination. That child had no traumatic injury to the skull. Dr. G and her team turned their attention from the skull to the rest of the body. What was really telling, and this is really important, is that there are rootlets, little roots, growing into the bone. When the roots are growing into a bone, the bone has to be totally decomposed first. Roots don't grow into rotting flesh. Roots also don't go into moving objects. This finding reinforces what Dr. G and her team found at the scene where the remains were recovered. Namely, that the body had been lying there for a long time. About the same time, Kaylee went missing. Those bones were there for
for months. She was dumped at the very early stages of her decomposing. Those are things we know by the science. Next, the doctors take a closer look at each bone individually, searching for clues about how this child died. We're looking at the bones under the dissecting microscope, and that was mostly the work of Dr. Warren and Dr. Schultz. They're looking for any kind of subtle fractures, old or new, blows uh, to uh, the chest area, which maybe caused some hairline fractures, or a knife uh, that maybe nicked the rib, anything that might help us indicate trauma. Hit by a car, uh, rolled over, anything. But their detailed exam yields no definitive cause of death. There was just absolutely no signs of traumatic injury to that child. If we didn't find anything, it didn't really mean that it didn't happen. Still searching for a cause of death, Dr. G has one last place to look. Toxicology at least needed to be attempted, and it wasn't going to be conventional toxicology. Conventional toxicology is we take blood or tissue samples and analyze it. These were dry bones, and when I mean dry bones, there is no soft tissue on those bones, and there's no marrow inside those cavities. It's dry right as a bone. We knew it was a long shot to find any kind of drugs in the bone. We're trying to leave no stone unturned. If there was something that could be answered from this body, we wanted to find it. I called Dr. Goldberger up at the University of Florida, who is a prominent toxicologist, and asked if he could help. We looked for illicit drugs, uh, prescription drugs, over-the-counter drugs, a whole wide range, hundreds of different types of drugs. We wanted to check for chloroform because we clearly knew from both the media at this point and from the police that there was some connection with chloroform. If chloroform was given to Kelly, it would have knocked her out. Traces of chloroform can linger in the air for over a month in confined spaces, like the trunk of a car. But it's a very different story in a body or skeleton. Chloroform doesn't have a half-life even of a, a few days. So when the results come back from the lab, as Dr. G anticipated, there's no evidence of any drugs. In the end, we found no chloroform, no evidence of intoxicants at all in any of the samples that we evaluated. Could someone have given a drug or a substance to Callie and have killed her? And the answer is yes. Although I strongly suspect that it was an asphyxial type of death, uh, possibly mixed with drugs, um, wasn't enough to give the cause of death. Then, on December 19th, the results of the DNA testing come back from the FBI. It told us this is Kaylee Marie Anthony. The chance of someone else having that same DNA was one in 2.9 trillion, trillion. That was good enough for me. After a thorough examination in the field and in the morgue, Dr. G also knows the manner of Kaylee's death. The manner of death, though, is an opinion based on available information, including examination of the body, information from the scene, as well as circumstantial evidence. Based on all of this, the manner of death in this case is homicide. I truly felt by the circumstances, by the duct tape, by the way she was thrown into those plastic bags and hidden and left to rot, that this was a homicide. I don't speak for the state. I don't speak for the police. I don't speak for any lawyers. I don't speak for any defendants. I speak to try to find the truth.
now, with Dr. G's official ruling of homicide, lawyers on both sides get ready for the trial of the century. Coming up, the prosecution reveals their disturbing theory of how Kaylee was murdered. Why would you put duct tape over the face of a child? Google searches were conducted for, quote, how to make chloroform. Is that still a possibility of how she died? You bet. On May 24th, 2011, almost three years after two-year-old Kaylee Anthony went missing, her mother, Casey, is about to stand trial for murder. Casey was indicted on first-degree murder charges based largely on forensic evidence. There's a lot more to this story than you guys could ever, ever imagine. And it's all gonna come out. People lined up in the middle of the night to try to get tickets for, for that trial. Everyone wanted to try to get a glimpse of history. It was clearly a media circus. You see the huge crowd. This is the biggest crowd that has been here. There are deputies here sort of trying to control the chaos. Going into the trial, many who have been following the case believe a guilty verdict is likely. As difficult as it may be for anyone to accept that a mother would intentionally kill her own child, from the evidence that you will hear in this case, there is no other conclusion that can be drawn. One of the prosecution's most compelling arguments is the fact that Casey did not report her daughter missing for 31 days. No mom is not going to know where their kid is for 31 days and not do something about it. Another cornerstone of the prosecution's case is Casey's statement about a non-existent babysitter kidnapping Kaylee. She comes up with stories that had no basis in fact, that were lies. That is so classic with a child death of a homicide. But some of the most damning evidence the prosecution points to is from Casey's own car. The dead body smell, the strand of Kaylee's decomposing hair, and the levels of chloroform. Even more alarming is the discovery that somebody in the Anthony's home looked up how to make chloroform on the computer three months before Kaylee disappeared. On Friday, March 21st, 2008, Google searches were conducted for, quote, how to make chloroform. Next, the prosecution moves on to the most horrific finding, the pieces of duct tape recovered from Kaylee's skull. There are three overlapping uh, pieces of duct tape. Not one piece of duct tape, but three pieces of duct tape. This child was found in a field um, decomposed. The duct tape somewhere located on the lower half of this face. Why would someone put duct tape over the nose and mouth of a child? The only reason you come up with is because you don't want them to breathe anymore. It was the prosecution theory that either the child died as a result of chloroform or chloroform, which enabled the perpetrator to place duct tape over the child's mouth and nose and suffocate her. You put the various elements together, the chloroform in the trunk, the odor in the trunk from a dead body, and the hair, and the only scenario that explained all of it was that um, Casey had used chloroform to um, render Kaylee unconscious and basically killed her. But then the defense gives their shocking version of what happened to Kaylee. This is not a murder case. This is not a manslaughter case. Her death was covered up. Coming up, for the very first time, Dr. G responds to the defense's explosive accusations. He has the nerve to call my work shoddy?
In May 2011, the murder trial of Casey Anthony is heating up as the defense is about to present their shocking theory as to how her two-year-old daughter Kaylee died. Kaylee Anthony died on June 16, 2008, when she drowned in her family's swimming pool. The defense claims that George Anthony found Kaylee dead, drowned in the family pool when Casey wasn't watching her. Then they imply George disposed of Kaylee's body in the swamp where she was eventually found. Her death was covered up. This is not a murder case. This is not a manslaughter case. This is a sad, tragic accident that snowballed out of control. When Dr. G is called to the stand, she testifies this scenario is completely out of line with how parents react during an accidental drowning. I have over 20 years of experience dealing with mothers whose children have died accidentally. This is not how they react. When the person finds the child, they call 911 because there is a chance that that child might live. And what if a person finds an obviously drowned body, is so obviously deceased, what then? No matter how uh, stiff that body is, they always call 911. In the past 10 years, we've had over 120 cases of kids under six drowned in pools. They're all transported. They're all calling 911. I've had mothers on crack cocaine that kids die, and they're still devastated. They're screaming because you don't know how long that kid was in the water, and you want to try to save it. Nothing fits a drowning. There's not one shred of evidence that that occurred. Then the defense rips apart the prosecution's theory that Casey looked up how to make chloroform on the computer. They assert that the search was actually done by her mother. Cindy was looking up chlorophyll, a green pigment found in plants. I started looking up chlorophyll, and then that prompted me to look up chloroform. The defense points to the fact that Dr. G and the toxicologist, Dr. Goldberger, found no trace of chloroform or any drugs in Kaylee's remains. We found nothing. We found no volatiles. But Dr. G is not given the chance to make it clear to the jury that traces of chloroform in the body dissipate in less than a few days. So it would be impossible to find after six months. We couldn't find drugs and couldn't find even products of decomposition. Uh, it was just nothing there. Does that mean that there was never drug in her? No, it can't be found anymore. Things break down. I'm not saying it was never there. I'm saying it couldn't be found. Is that still a possibility of how she died? You bet. Next, Baez suggests the duct tape could just as well have been used to bind the bags Kaylee was put in and never used to cover her mouth or nose. And you have no idea as to whether this tape was used to wrap Kaylee's remains. Although the defense tries to contradict Dr. G's scientific findings, she knows that the duct tape was put on Kaylee's face before or during the early stages of decomposition. During decomposition, the jawbone falls off because it's heavy. But this one was together, and the only explanation is that tape protecting it. It was a horrendous piece of information when you think of already this child had been put in a bag, put in another bag, thrown into a canvas bag, tossed behind a rotting log, and also had duct tape attached to the face. There is no child that should have duct tape on its face when it dies. There is no reason to put duct tape on the face after they die. Next, the defense, set on proving that Kaylee was not a victim of homicide, begins to chip away at Dr. G's autopsy 
by calling in their own medical examiner, Dr. Werner Spitz. Dr. Spitz, who did his own autopsy of Kaylee's remains, states that one of his sharpest criticisms of Dr. G is that she did not open Kaylee's skull. To not open the head, I think, is a failure. Where the head is not opened, that tells me about a shoddy autopsy. He dwelled on this failure to open the skull, which was nothing more than smoke in mares. Dr. G is not called to the witness stand after Dr. Spitz. So she never gets the chance to explain to the jury that in her opinion, his logic is not only flawed, but also irrelevant, considering it was a completely dry skeleton. There was no reason to open that skull. We could clearly see in the skull. We looked inside, there was nothing there but dirt at the base of the skull. If we had cut the skull, the skull would have fallen apart in our hands. Which is exactly what happened when Dr. Spitz cut open Kaylee's skull during his exam. When you opened the skull, you actually broke it, didn't you? I didn't know that I broke it. He broke it? He caused a fracture and it fell apart? And then he has a nerve to call my work shoddy? But the defense doesn't let up on its contention that Kaylee died by accident. And in order to convince the jury, they attacked the very foundation of Dr. G's findings. Dr. Jan Garavaglia, you would think that you can get a medical examiner to come and talk to you about medicine, about science. A person on the street riding a bicycle could give you these same facts and say the same thing. This is not science. I don't know what they're talking about with the examination of the body. The conclusions were scientifically defensible. That is not a principle that I make up. Immediately. It's not because this was a high profile case that I wanted to do a thorough job. This was a two year old little girl that was found in the woods. Coming up, Dr. G reveals how she knows Kaylee was murdered. The circumstances a tremendous amount. Of course, we're outside the courtroom here. The defense in the Casey Anthony murder trial is doing everything they can to tear apart the prosecution's contention that two-year-old Kaylee Anthony was murdered by her mother. Now, they are attacking Dr. G's ruling. Do you have an opinion as to the manner of death? Homicide. The defense relentlessly hammers home the fact that Dr. G can't come to a conclusion as to how Kaylee was killed. Despite the investigations, the toxicology, the anthropologists, all of these things, there is no scientific or medical evidence to establish the cause of this child's death. I believe we can reliably say it's a homicide, but I don't know the means for which that homicide occurred. So the bottom line is when you say and you place a label homicide, the indeterminate means, you're saying that circumstantial evidence to you says that it probably was a homicide. The circumstances of death did not uh, fit anything but a homicide. You, the, the, the circumstances. Yes. It is modern practice of forensic pathology to look at all the situations. You cannot make an anatomic diagnosis as far as the manner of death. It's always based on everything, the body, the scene, the history. In this case, the circumstances tell a tremendous amount. First of all, not reporting her missing for 31 days, then coming up with a story that she's kidnapped. None of that fit on why this child was found down the street from her house in a plastic bag hidden with duct tape over its face. There is no reason for a two-year-old child to decompose in a field in a plastic bag with duct tape over its face. 
was clearly a homicide. The defense was unable to shake her on that point. We just felt that the evidence was so overwhelming that um, the jury would find her guilty. The trial draws to a close as the nation anxiously awaits a verdict. People drove to downtown Orlando just to be outside the courthouse to hear the verdict being rendered. It was chaotic. People were screaming. They don't have to wait long. On July 5th, 2011, after deliberating just 11 hours, the jury reaches a verdict. As to the charge of first degree murder, we, the jury, find the defendant not guilty. Casey Anthony is convicted of only four misdemeanor counts of lying to law enforcement. It was just unimaginable to me that 12 people could look at that evidence and not find her guilty. I don't understand people who think Elvis is still alive. I don't understand people who think that we never landed on the moon. I don't get those people. So I don't get these people either. I think this jury was waiting for that CSI moment. I don't think they had a clear understanding that a circumstantial evidence case can be more compelling than a case where there is eyewitness testimony and that misconception, I believe, in no small part led to the not guilty verdict in this case. The fact that Dr. G couldn't say the duct tape killed her, the chloroform killed her, that was all they heard, that was all they, that was all that mattered. You know, if we couldn't say that, then that was the end for them. How the trial ended up is not something I have control over and it's not my job. And I don't deal with guilt or innocence. I deal with the facts that we can find. Many people react to the verdict with disbelief and outrage. I think they felt that justice wasn't served, um, at least not for Kaylee, because in all of this, it seems that Kaylee got lost. Everything was about Casey, and nothing was about the toddler. is that people would like closure on this case. I wish I could have given it to them. I wish someday we knew what happened to little Kaylee Marie. But I can tell you, it was a homicide.